My name is Ayush Alavadi. Now, the United Nations core operating budget is likely to shrink by more than $285 million in 2018. That's a whopping 5%. The US government has claimed credit for the budget cut and have said that it negotiated a 5% cut in the UN budget. Now, the UN General Assembly voted to approve a $5.4 billion regular operating budget for 2018-19. The new budget included cuts to most departments. Now, the US is obviously the largest contributor to the UN budget, paying 25% of the entire amount. Now this comes a week after 120 countries voted in favor of a UN resolution calling on the US to drop its recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Now just to discuss this development and to dissect and analyze what this means for the US, the UN and the region, we're joined by Rosa Friedman, Professor of Law and International Development. Um, Rosa, thanks so much for joining us. You've, you know, you've obviously been working on this extensively. Um, I want to start off by asking you how this move will really impact the UN, given that 22% of the funding for the international body comes from the United States. Well, the starting point is that, as you said, there's about $5 billion for the regular budget of the United Nations, and that funds the secretariat, it funds everyday activities, human rights, development activities. That's separate to the 7 or $8 billion that's spent on peacekeeping every year, to which the US contributes 28% of the budget. And the contributions of each state is, is calculated according to its gross national product and the percentage of its gross national product compared with the global gross national product. So the U.S. is the largest contributor, but it actually only contributes 22 percent of the regular budget, even though it has a much larger share of the gross national product, because we cap the, the amount that any one country can give. Now, while some of that money, $285 million, as you said, will be shaved from the budget, that's nowhere near the amount of money that the U.S., Japan, China have asked for the U.N. budget to be retracted by. In fact, every year, the largest donors ask for the U.N. to have a smaller budget, as we would expect. And every year, that there's pushback from all the rest of the states, because we know that the U.N. needs that money to do the very good work that it does on the ground. Right, you know, Rosa, it becomes interesting because you consider what Nikki Haley really said, um, you know, saying this is a step in the right direction. It was an open threat, especially after the UN Security Council vote uh, going against the UN US stance. I want to understand from you, is the US indulging in, well, a strange sort of power play at the UN with this particular decision to, to actually withdraw or cut the budget? Well, if we look at what Donald Trump said a year ago, he wanted to withdraw all U.S. funding of the U.N. And in June, he put to Congress that the U.S. should withdraw most of its funding. And Congress said no. And if we look at what the U.N. Secretary General said in October, they recognized that there would be a $200 million retraction of funding as compared with what they were asking for. So this announcement this week is really political posturing. We've all known that this has been coming, that the budgets would be shaved, that there there are places where budgets can be retracted in terms of managerial um, budgets or in terms of pensions. Um, but the announcement this week seems to be Trump's way of politically posturing at home to his domestic audience, but also trying to throw his weight around at the United Nations. Right, Rosé, you know, that's, of course, what's happening in the U.S. But, you know, considering what has happened in this case, I want to understand whether you think this would send a strong message to the other countries, especially considering the almost unanimous vote uh, when it came to this particular instance at the Security Council. Do you think this would serve as a deterrent? Perhaps, you know, other countries would be wary of voting against the U.S. considering such strong action on their part? Well, listen, a, a couple of days after the um, almost unanimous vote in the Security Council that the U.S. had to veto, there was a unanimous vote about putting sanctions onto North Korea, which was a vote that the U.S. had pushed for. So clearly, um, the U.S.'s position in the Security Council hasn't been hampered by that vote about Jerusalem. The question about what happened at the General Assembly is in some ways more interesting and ties in with the question about the vote for the International Court of Justice, where the UK judge was not successful and the Indian judge was. What we're seeing at the General Assembly is a, a global geopolitical shift whereby countries realise that working together, they can they can 
move forward in a way that they can't do as small regional groups or small political blocs. And it's that kind of working together that I think is going to make effective changes at the UN and the kind of changes that threaten not only the US, but China and Russia and other big political powers. You know, Rosa, it's interesting you say that because even when it comes to this particular budget, obviously this is separate from the peacekeeping budget uh, to which India is a massive contributor as well in terms of forces or, or uh, resources. But all over in the global community, I think, well, the key question would also be what really happens to the Israel-Palestine conflict and, and what does this mean for the region on the whole? Well, I think the question about Israel and Palestine is very difficult under the current administration, both in terms of the US and in terms of Israel, but also in terms of what we're seeing in the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the, the group of, of Muslim states. There's been a splintering within the OIC, and we saw in the last couple of weeks that splintering between Saudi Arabia and Turkey in terms of how they want to deal with Israel and Palestine. I don't think we can look at that one UN General Assembly vote or what's happened now with the announcement about the budget as being the only indicator of where the Israel-Palestine peace negotiations are going. We have to look to Western Europe and see that they voted in favor of that resolution and against the United States and that they are setting themselves up, the Western European countries of the European Union, to be the next peace negotiators. And no one knows how Israel will respond to that or how Palestine will respond to that. So I think it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen next. You know, Rosa, because that's that's the key word. It's very it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen next, especially considering what's happening in the U.S. as well, and considering Donald Trump's stance on the U.N. right from his campaign uh, up until now. And that's that's my last question to you. And I want to understand whether you view this as perhaps a policy measure uh, from the U.S. and Donald Trump to put its interests above that of the larger good, so to say, and also whether, well, the Trump administration and the U.S. are walking or treading a dangerous path with such policy action. Listen, I think um, the, the amounts of money that we're talking about here are relatively small compared with the amounts of money, for example, that my country in the U.K. spends on the National Health Service, which is $100 billion dollars a year. We're talking here at about $13 billion a year for peacekeeping and for the regular budget of the United Nations. This is this is small fry compared with the money spent on the Pentagon, for example, in the US. What's happening here is that Donald Trump is saying, I'm putting the priorities of the US taxpayer above the priorities of the global good. He's making a very significant statement in, in what he's doing. But what we also see within the US is that Congress and even to some extent Nikki Haley are pushing back against him. And I think that the domestic politics of what's going on in terms of the US approach to the UN is not very different to the domestic politics we see in Russia, that we see in China, sometimes even in Japan, towards the UN. I don't think we should be too worried, but I think we should definitely be keeping an eye on it. Right, Rose, I really appreciate you taking time out and speaking with us on Bloomberg Quint. And for all of you watching, thanks so much for watching Bloomberg Quint. Stay tuned.